Hi everybody, uh, my name's Rich and I'm a vicar in the benefice of Shawbury, Stanton and Morton Corbett which covers three rural parishes in North Shropshire. Our three church buildings are all closed for business during the coronavirus pandemic so we've switched to online sermons. If you're joining us you are very welcome. If you didn't catch last week's sermon which was specially written for Mothering Sunday then you can find it somewhere up here. Uh, if you click the little link that's appeared in the top corner of the screen then it will take you there directly. However today's sermon is for Sunday the 29th of March, the fifth Sunday of Lent. I'm going to be preaching from the Gospel of John chapter 11 verses 1 to 45. Uh, if you didn't catch that, I've written it in the video description, which you'll find somewhere under your screen, somewhere about here, I suspect. And if you haven't already read the passage, I would encourage you to do so now and pause the video. It's also acceptable to pause your video and go and get a tea or a coffee. Just don't slurp too loudly if you're watching this next to somebody else. All right, before I start my sermon properly, let's pray. Heavenly Father, may my spoken word uh, be faithful to your written word and in doing so lead us all closer to the living word who is your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I've been feeling rather sorry for myself this week. On Monday I received a text message from the NHS followed swiftly by a letter on Tuesday which was telling me that I'd been identified as someone who is at risk of complications if I contract COVID-19. For those of you who don't know why, I've got Crohn's disease and I take regular immune suppressants uh, to help manage that. I'm therefore at greater risk of picking up bugs and viruses and then crashing hard when I get them. So I've been told to self-isolate within my own home. So on Tuesday morning, I went round to all three of the church buildings that I helped to care for. I locked the doors. I put up notices that told people to keep out unless they checked with me first and I drove home with a real sense of sadness. To make it worse I then had to phone two funeral directors and inform them that I was no longer able to take two funerals for which I had agreed to officiate previously. Thankfully my retired colleague Mike was able to stand in and take them for me so I was able to save the funeral directors from having to search for a replacement but that didn't stop me from feeling a real sense of loss, a loss of freedom, a loss of usefulness, even a loss of identity. And that was coupled with a sense of guilt. I felt guilty for locking church buildings and guilty for being unable to take funerals. So when I picked up my Bible and looked at today's passage from John's Gospel, I was particularly struck by the comments of Martha and Mary directed at Jesus when he arrives at their home. Independently of each other, they both say to him, Lord, if, you'd not, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now that is a statement that pulled no punches. Another way of saying it would be, it's your fault that he's dead. I hasten to add that this is speculation, but I wonder if the way that they speak to Jesus betrays a sense of self-guilt within Martha and Mary, or perhaps a sense of helplessness. Are they putting the blame on Jesus in order to deflect it from themselves? Which led me down a train of thought in relation to our current situation. With the restrictions placed on all of us this week, some of us will be in an unfamiliar position of realising that we've lost control. I wonder how many of us are feeling helpless. And some of my clergy colleagues have already started fielding questions like, is this God's doing? Is this judgement from God? Or why would God let something like this happen? In other words, can we play, play, pin the blame on God, please? There's an age-old question that goes round saying, how can you believe in a good God when evil exists in the world? There's a whole stream of Christian thinking which tries to answer that. Like most Christian thinking, at some point somebody slaps a posh name on it, and in this uh, case, uh, that posh name is the Odyssey. Well, the book of Job in the Old Testament spends about 38 chapters trying to answer that question. Why do bad things happen to good people? 
So it's nothing new here, folks. Getting grumpy with God when things go wrong is human and it's perfectly understandable. So if you want to rant at God a bit about all that's going on, I want to say, go ahead, feel free. Believe me, God has heard it all before anyway. He is used to getting the blame for everything. But as you pray, know that God is with you in the hurting and the frustration. Note that in today's passage, Jesus is greatly disturbed and deeply moved as he witnesses Mary and the others weeping. And that he himself weeps as they lead him to the tomb of Lazarus. God is not an unfeeling monster in the sky. He comes to us in our moments of distress he, and he walks with us through them. In the passage that we read, God is present as Jesus. In our situation now, God is present to us by his Holy Spirit. Know that he is with you, that he hears you and that he weeps with you. Having said all that, there is some truth to what Mary and Martha say. Had Jesus turned up when they first sent him word that Lazarus was ill, there was every possibility that he'd have been able to heal him of the illness that eventually killed him. So why doesn't Jesus turn up straight away? Why not just show up and heal Lazarus? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, for that, it's worth looking at verse 4, where Jesus has just heard about the message. There he says... The sickness will not end in death. At which point our first instinct might be to bristle at his comment and point out that it does end in death. It's there in black and white in verse 14 when Jesus himself says, Lazarus is dead. Of course, we'd be missing one important point. Yes, Lazarus does die, but no, that is not the end. So let's go back to read verse 4 in all its greatness. Jesus says, this sickness will not end in death. Or in some translations it may say, um, <coughs> this sickness is not for the purpose of death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of Man may be, sorry, so the Son of God may be glorified through it. Jesus identifies a deeper purpose in this illness. So let's think about what might have happened if Jesus had turned up on time and healed Lazarus. After all, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, the disciples and a huge bunch of other people had already witnessed Jesus do miraculous healing. That would explain why the two sisters sent for him when their brother got ill. <coughs> so if Jesus had turned up and healed Lazarus again, it would have taught them nothing new. But Jesus wants to, them to take a bigger step. Remember how Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Well, she follows that up with the second statement in verse 22. But even now, I know that whatever you ask God, God will give to you. Martha recognises that Jesus has a real and current link to God. She's showing some faith in God, but she fails to show true faith in Jesus. Because at this moment, she has an inadequate understanding. Martha stands before God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, the one to whom the Father has given all authority to render judgment. But she hasn't realised it yet. And when Jesus responds to her comments saying, your brother will rise, Martha's reply is telling. Yes, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. But that's not what Jesus is promising right now. And even though Martha goes on to profess that she believes that Jesus is the Christ, she still hasn't clicked what Jesus is on about when they finally reach the tomb and Jesus asks the people to take away the stone. As we can see in her comment, she says, Lord, it's been four days. It stinks already. She's simply unable to get her head around the idea that Jesus can bring a dead man back to life. The return to life of Lazarus demonstrates God's glory in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. The physical outcome is the same as it would have been had Jesus shown up four days earlier. Lazarus is alive and well, 
but the spiritual outcome is wildly different. Jesus is not just an amazing healer, but he's one with power over life and death. We're living in a time when it would be reasonable to cry out to God and say, do something! If that's not part of your prayers right now, I'd actually be quite surprised. And I'd also be pretty surprised if God was sat on a heavenly cloud doing nothing right now. In fact, I'm already hearing stories of how he's at work in all sorts of ways. But what doing something means for us and what it means for God might be very different. Also, when we expect that to happen and when he might choose to reveal himself are two very different things. But God's purposes are just. God's timing is always perfect, even if it doesn't feel like it. And then we have to remember that he is far, far wiser than we are. Our church buildings are closed and locked right now, and we've got no idea when they're going to reopen. Our freedom is curtailed, and as I said, I suspect many of you are feeling a profound sense of loss. But while it lasts, I will continue to praise my maker. I will continue to call on him to do something. And I will continue to trust in his great goodness. So to end today, I invite you to join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, at this time of great uncertainty and fear, we call upon you. We ask you to do something. But we only have a part of the picture. We only see in a mirror dimly. So help us to trust in your greater purposes. Give us faith in your great goodness and confidence in your power over all things. We ask this in the name of the one who demonstrated his power over life and death through the raising of his friend Lazarus, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you all.